tonight, brothers and sisters, in our study of the book of Revelation, we look this evening to the letter of the Apostle John penned under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to the church in Pergamum. A Pergamum, unlike the cities of Ephesus and Smyrna, which we have looked at already thus far, was not on the shores of the Aegean Sea, as were those two great commercial centers, but it was about, oh, maybe 40 to 50 miles northeast of Smyrna, about 10 or 15 miles inland from the Aegean Sea. It was not so much a great commercial center as it was cultural center. For example, the uh, parchment that was used in the writing of the scriptures and other uh, legal documents of the day was perfected in the city of Pergamon. It's interesting to note that whereas the uh, church at Ephesus erred in a sinful intolerance of one another, the church in Pergamum erred in a sinful tolerance of wicked men. We look this evening at Revelation 2, verses 12 through 17. Hear the word of the Lord. To the angel of the church in Pergamum write, These are the words of him who has the sharp, double-edged sword. I know where you live, where Satan has his throne. Yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was put to death in your city, where Satan lives. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. You have people there who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin by eating food, sacrificed to idols, by committing sexual immorality. Likewise, you also have those who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Repent, therefore, otherwise I will soon come to you and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will also give him a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to him who receives it. Thus far the reading, God's holy word. And as always, dear friends, I urge you to keep your Bibles open and handy as we look at our text together this evening. Dear congregation of Jesus Christ, It is said that in the early days of Rome, the Greek philosopher Carneades worked diligently to try to inculcate or foster a spirit of universal skepticism throughout the city. In fact, according to World Book Encyclopedia, and I quote, Carneades believed that no absolute standard of truth exists, end of quote. In practice, therefore, Carneades used to argue alternately both for and against every given proposition. He believed indeed that a great mind was only attained by remaining in suspense and undecidedness concerning any significant issue of the day. And for anyone to conclude definitively on any given proposition was a sign of an ignorant mind. Well, interestingly enough, about that same time, a man by the name of Cato arose, a Roman philosopher and statesman. And Cato, according again to World Book Encyclopedia, and again I quote, declared that It is much better to consider principle much more important than compromise, end of quote. And Cato appealed to his colleagues in the Roman Senate to expel Carneades from the city, saying, and again I quote, that Carneades is a trifler in Rome. 
who with his spirit of skepticism and compromise would introduce hopeless moral corruption into the life of the city. End of quote. Well, dear brothers and sisters, what the Roman philosopher and statesman Cato was battling against in Rome in the political realm, the church at Pergamum, interestingly enough, was also battling against only in the spiritual realm. And indeed, as we look to our text in Revelation 2 this evening, we find that just as was true for the church in Pergamon so many years ago, so too, brothers and sisters, the word of the Lord comes to each and every one of us tonight, both individually and collectively, saying that you and I must resist. And you and I must refuse to engage in compromise with this fallen sinful world. We must refuse to engage in accommodation with this fallen sinful world. We must refuse to adopt the sinful principles and practices of the world lest we fall into a dangerous and deadly sin which the scriptures equate with dancing with the devil. Dancing with the devil. Now, what does that mean? And indeed, what did Christ command the church in Pergamum to do about it? And again, what does the word of the Lord say to each and every one of us gathered here tonight? Well, brothers and sisters, as we look to our text for a few moments, we find that in order for us to avoid both the sin and the consequences of the sin of dancing with the devil, we, along with the believers in Pergamum so many years ago, must first of all seek by the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit to remain in the faith. To remain in the faith. Look at our text with me, if you will, as it begins in Revelation 2, verse 12, where we read, to the angel, to the angelos. We uh, read of the city of Los Angeles, the city of angels. A city, by the way, which I heard a passing news report, did they just have an earthquake? Today, I didn't hear any details, but I just caught that in passing. Los Angeles, city of angels. Angelos means angel, to be translated angel or messenger. Now, without going into all of the possible interpretations of this, uh, this uh, word as it's used in the letters, uh, recall that we're operating with the definition of angel referring to the spirit or character of the church personified. The spirit or character of the church personified to the angel of the church in Pergamum, right? Look with me. These are the words of him who has the sharp, double-edged sword. Now, friends, we've noticed thus far in our study of the letters to the seven churches that Christ oft times introduced himself in a particularly comforting way to each of the particular churches according to their need. Why, then, did he introduce himself as the one who holds the sharp, double-edged sword? Well, for example, it's interesting to note that Pergamum, as the uh, capital of uh, the Roman province of Asia, was one of the few cities around that was entrusted with the sword in the sense of capital punishment. Not everyone could put someone to death in Rome. In Pergamum, they could. And that, of course, according to um, Romans 13.4, is a God-given right that God rightly gives the government. And it seems that one of the, the blights on the character of America today is the increasing reluctance to uh, perform capital punishment for capital offenses. And yet from Genesis through Romans at least, and here in Revelation, God entrusts the government with the sword. And that was true for Pergamum. But now remember, as we've studied already in our series, that the Roman government took not too kindly toward Christians. You could easily lose your life by singing what we sang this evening, by playing what we played this evening, by professing what we profess this evening. And so the early church oftentimes lived in fear of losing their life. And so certainly it was comforting for them to read of this letter from the one who has the sharp double-edged sword. But indeed, what are other biblical scriptural implications? Do those terms ring any biblical bells? Well, turn back a page or two with me, if you will, for example, to Revelation 1, verse 16. Do you recall in 16 of Revelation 1 that we read of this glorious vision of the Son of Man? We studied it in depth, did we not? And in Revelation 1, verse 16, we read of our Lord Jesus. In his right hand, he held seven stars, notice, and out of his mouth came a sharp, 
double-edged sword. Christ holds the sword. Now, where else do we read of this sharp double-edged sword in the scriptures? Well, for example, turn with me, dear friends, back a few more pages to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. Look with me. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, for example, we read, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. Young people, do not deceive yourselves into believing that this is a dry, dusty, dead book. It is not. The Bible said it is alive, it is active, it is sharper than a double-edged sword. What does that mean? Look with me. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Now, friends, as I've been studying and meditating upon this sharp double-edged swordness of the scriptures, it occurred to me this week, maybe you always knew this, it just came to me this week, that, that the double-edged sword means that it cuts two ways. That, I never really thought of it that way before. It cuts two ways. It cuts both ways. For example, it brings comfort and it brings conviction. It speaks of blessing and it speaks of cursing. For example, John 3.36, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. But whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on him. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So too, turn over to 1 Corinthians 6 with me, if you will. Back a few more pages in the Scriptures toward the beginning of the New Testament. 1 Corinthians 6. And let's pick this up in about verse 9. Look with me. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9. Paul writes, Do you not know? that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexual offenders, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. The sword cuts that way. But notice, then it cuts the other way. And that is what some of you were. Praise God for the past tense of that verb. And that is what some of you were. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified, legally declared not guilty in God's heavenly court. Boys and girls, remember, God views me just as if I never sinned. That's what justified means. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. That sword that cuts two ways is held in the hand, not of the Roman government, but of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's go back to our text in Revelation 2 as the letter continues. Verse 13, look with me. I know, says Christ, and recall, brothers and sisters, we learn that this refers to an intimate personal knowledge, not a passing acquaintance. I know where you live, where Satan has his throne. Now, what do you suppose that means? What was true about Pergamum that perhaps was not true of some of the other cities to which John writes that would cause him under the inspiration of the Spirit to say, I know where you live where Satan has his throne. Well, different theories have been put forth. For example, in the 1,000-foot Acropolis where all of the temples to so many of the gods was, was held or were uh, built in Pergamum, At the top of the Acropolis was this humongous altar to the pagan god, Zeus. And it sort of hovered over the entire city. Perhaps that's what John meant. But also recall that Pergamum was, I want to say a center, but we almost could say the center of the growing cult of emperor worship, which was becoming the most deadly Uh, aspect of religions and paganism in Rome for the Christian. Perhaps that's what John meant. But it's also interesting to note that in Pergamum, there was a statue, there was an altar, there was a temple to the Greek god Asclepius. Asclepius, the god of healing. A god who had a serpent for his symbol. Interesting. 
called a doctor friend of mine the other day to double check that the, uh, the American Medical Association has as its symbol a, a staff with a serpent on it. And he had just been reading, ironically enough, that that was uh, taken from Asclepius back in uh, the early centuries A.D., which, by the way, in turn, may have dated back, I don't know for sure, to um, Numbers chapter 21, where Moses raised the serpent on the pole in the wilderness. It's all tied in. But be that as it may, uh, no doubt the, the early church in Pergamum, when they saw this altar, the symbol of Asclepius, they saw through their spiritual eyes what the Revelation refers to as that ancient serpent called the devil. And so perhaps that may be what John is referring to when he speaks of I know where you live, where Satan has his throne. We don't know for sure. Maybe it refers to a compilation of all these aspects. We don't know for sure. But it does convey a sense where Satan has a strong foothold, does it not? Where he is preeminent, does it not? And we look at our own country today. Think about this. I read about three, four days ago that there are more outlets for hardcore pornography in America than there are McDonald's franchises. I didn't know that. I just read that three or four days ago in the newspaper. There are more outlets for hardcore pornography than there are McDonald's franchises. And it seems like there's a McDonald's franchise everywhere. Think about the fact that in America there are nearly two million abortions. Children slaughtered in their mother's womb every year. Think of it. Think of the fact that, that any public reading of Scripture in the, in the public square, any uh, public prayer, any reverential use of the name of God is being increasingly systematically excised from public life. It's true. We begin to see increasingly that we are living in a, in a land and certainly in a world where it seems as if Satan has a throne. And that's what the believers of Pergamon were battling. I know where you live, look with me, where Satan has his throne. Yet, you remain true. The Greek literally says you hold fast, you grasp, you firmly hold on to. Same word used, by the way, is Revelation 2, verse 1, where it says Christ Holds. Remember, we looked at that word, the seven stars in his right hand. And it refers to the fact that he holds them tightly, that he is in control of these angels and of the churches. And it's the same word in the Greek as is used here, that these uh, believers in Pergamon hold or remain true to his name, to the name of Jesus. You did not renounce your faith in me. The original language tells us it's referring to a, a particular incident. Maybe a judicial decree, maybe uh, a, a public uprising against the saints. We don't know for sure. But it's referring to something that happened at some time. Yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me. Even in the days of Antipas, we don't know who that is other than what we read right here, my faithful witness, my faithful martos. It's where we get the word martyr from. Friends, the word martyr was not originally used of someone who died for the faith. It was originally used as someone who gave testimony to the faith. And so many Christians died for giving testimony to the faith. It took on the connotation of someone who died, a martyr. He was my faithful martus who was put to death in your city where Satan lives. Now think about that. Putting to death for the faith. You know, we talked last Lord's Day evening about remaining faithful to the end. And remember, we recall the historical fact that Polycarp, the bishop of Smyrna, was put to death for the faith around 150 A.D. And when I was at that uh, conference at Westminster Seminary on death and dying several days ago, uh, Dr. Jack Miller, he's the uh, president of World Harvest Ministries, former Westminster professor, said, I did not know this, that today in the 20th century, not 2,000 years ago, in the 1990s, today, every year throughout the world, how many Christians do you think are put to death because they're Christians? It blew my mind. I had no idea. 150,000 Christians are being put to death throughout the world today, every year. And those numbers are expected to reach to about 200,000 a year by the year 2000 if the Lord tarries. The persecution is increasing throughout the world against the church of Jesus Christ. And brothers and sisters, what that means when you and I are doing warfare with Satan, and when you and I are seeking to be seduced by Satan, 
And when He is coming on to us with a spirit of skepticism and accommodation, and we find ourselves dancing with the devil, as it were, by the grace of God and in the power of the Spirit, each and every day, we must increasingly be walking in the Word. And we must be pleading and praying to God to rekindle our love for the Lord. And we must be asking Him to enable us to remain firm in the faith. That's what the Lord Jesus said to the believers at Pergamum. That's what He says to each and every one of us here tonight. If we desire to avoid the sin and the consequences of dancing with the devil. Now our text goes on, does it not? And we learn secondly, that if we desire to avoid the sin and the consequences of dancing with the devil, wherever we see that sin manifesting itself in our own hearts and lives, and the Bible says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, We must repent of that sin. We must repent of that sin. Let's look together at verse 14, Revelation 2. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. Boys and girls, did your mom or dad ever say to you, I've got some good news and some bad news? (laughs) That's in effect what what the Lord is saying. I've, I've got some good news and some bad news. I gave you the good news. Here's the bad news. I have a few things against you. You have people there who hold, kratos, there's that that firm holding on to, only they didn't hold on to the name of Jesus. You have people there who hold to the teaching of Balaam. Now, who was Balaam? Do you know your Old Testament Bible? I was going to say trivia. It's not really trivia. But do you know your Old Testament Bible history? Numbers 22 through Numbers 25 tells us that Balaam was a prophet who was called upon by Balak, the king of Moab, to come and pronounce a curse on the Israelites. You may recall, as he was making his way on his donkey, an angel of the Lord intercepted him and refused to permit him to go any further until he was going to become an instrument in the hand of the Lord instead of an instrument in the hand of Balak. But there's more to the story of Balaam, as the uh, Scripture here goes on to tell us. You have people there who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak, Numbers 25, 1 through 5 tells us, Numbers 31, verse 16 tells us, you have uh, people who hold to the teaching of Balaam who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin. The Greek says that he put a stumbling block in front of the Israelites by eating food, sacrificed to idols, and by committing sexual immorality. One commentator, dear friends, has said that uh, Balaam was the father of religious syncretism. He became a prototype of those who were dancing with the devil, if you will. Now, when it says here that he enticed them to uh, sin by eating food sacrificed to idols, that probably doesn't mean food that was purchased in the market after it had been sacrificed to idols. It most likely means that they were invited to the pagan feasts, and though they were Christians and professed the name of Christ, took part in those idolatrous practices. And not only so. They engaged in sexual immorality with the Moabite women. They wanted to have their cake and eat it too. Isn't that a danger? Isn't that a danger for you and for me today as as individuals who profess the name of Christ and as a church of Jesus Christ? Young people, for example, have you ever found yourself saying or thinking in your heart, hey, this is great. A little praise A little pornography. A little prayer. A little promiscuity. Moms and dads, other adults, I can come to church and bring my tithe, contribute my tithe, and then go home and cheat on my taxes. Sing of love to the Lord on Sunday. And on Monday, lust after my neighbor. Do you see the way Satan tries to seduce us? The Bible says he comes as an angel of light. And whether you're a boy or a girl, whether you're a teenager, whether you're a man or a woman or a senior citizen, does not matter. Turn over to uh, James chapter 4, verse 4 with me. James chapter 4, just back a few pages. James chapter 4, verse 4. Says in an unequivocal fashion, James 4, verse 4. You adulterous people. Don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred toward God? Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world 
becomes an enemy of God. The Bible says we can't have it both ways. There is no middle ground. We must be wholeheartedly committed to the Lord or we are holding fast to the teachings of Balaam. Prototype of one dancing with the devil. Let's go back to our text. Look with me, if you will, at verse 15 of Revelation 2. Likewise, you also have those who hold, kratos, to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Now, who were the Nicolaitans? We really don't know. But we do learn this from the name Nicolaitans. It's from two Greek words, nikao and leos. Nikao and leos. Literally, that name means conquer the people. It means conquer the people. Same thing Balaam means only in the Hebrew. Conquer the people. And the point that John is making is that the people here in their midst were not so much coming from Rome, persecuting from without. They were working seditiously and insidiously and subtly from within. For example, the the man Barkley, uh, the commentator, not the basketball player, young people, by the way, Barkley said, and I quote, the false teachers claimed not that they were destroying Christianity, but that they were presenting an improved and modernized version of it. And the church at Ephesus earlier wouldn't fall for that. They saw through that. The church and church at Pergamum did fall for that, and they were seduced by it. And so what does Jesus say? Look further with me. Verse 16 of Revelation 2. Jesus says, repent therefore. It's in the imperative. It's in the command. He says, act decisively. Quit messing around. Take a stand, says Jesus. Repent therefore. To repent literally means to think again. To change your mind. You're going in one direction. You turn around and you go in another direction. Repent therefore. Otherwise, I will soon come to you and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Brothers and sisters, interesting. Numbers 31, verse 8 tells us that Balaam died by the sword. Balaam died by the sword. And Jesus is saying if that in your life or in mine, or if this church or if in your church, we do not take action against the spirit of Balaam and the spirit of the Nicolaitans and the spirit of compromise with the world, Jesus will come Himself in judgment and He will do the job Himself. That's what it says. Repent therefore. Otherwise I will soon come to you and will fight against them with the sword. My now, brothers and sisters, what does that mean for you and me? It means that we've got to search our hearts. We have really got to search our hearts. We've got to pray for the Spirit to use the Word as the sharp double-edged sword and purge away all that is in us that is impure and unclean and unholy. And friend, as you look into your life tonight, as I look into mine, we probably know, we probably know our Achilles heel spiritually. Where Satan may try to tempt us or seduce us time and time again. Or maybe where you or I are compromising today. In our thought life or in our speech life or in our actions or in our financial realm or whatever. We know in our hearts where we're compromising. And Jesus calls upon you and upon me tonight to repent. Repent. And to turn away so that he will not have to come against us with the sword. But rather that we will take still another step toward breaking the dance in which we are engaged with the devil. Now friends, the Bible gives us a glorious promise as our text concludes. It says that if we, by the grace of God and in the power of the Holy Spirit, remain in the faith. And if we repent of our sin, we will surely receive our reward, both individually and collectively as the church of Jesus Christ. Look with me, if you will, at verse 17. He who has an ear, as Jesus often said in the Gospels, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now notice here, it says the Spirit is speaking to the churches. Why so? 2 Corinthians 3, verse 17 says the Lord is the Spirit. And here's a beautiful account of the Trinity. We have Jesus speaking with the double-edged sword. And here we have the Spirit says this. And it all ties together. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Look with me. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna. Now what does that hidden manna refer to? Boys and girls, have you ever heard the term manna before? You've learned about manna maybe in Sunday school or Christian school. When did God give His people manna? Old Testament or New Testament? Somebody tell me. Right, Old Testament. It was when they were wandering in the wilderness. And God gave them this miraculous bread from heaven. 
In fact, it's interesting. If you're taking notes, you might want to jot down Exodus 16, verses 23, and then 32 through 34 of Exodus 16, and Hebrews 9, verse 4. Hebrews 9, verse 4. Because we learn that a, a jar of manna, a golden jar of manna, was kept where, along with the two stone tablets of the law and Aaron's rod that had budded? Where were they placed? Right, not Noah's Ark, right? The, the Ark of the Covenant. And they were hidden there. Now, it's interesting. Why the words, I will give some of the hidden manna? Well, let me share this with you. Turn for a second in the back of our Psalters to page 71. Page 71. And uh, I'm going to quote from uh, the second book of Maccabees. And so that you don't misunderstand why I'm doing that, I want to give my confessional uh, presentation here first. Um, page 71, I think it is, Article 6 of the Belgic Confession. Yeah, Article 6, page 71, it talks about the difference between the canonical and apocryphal books. And if you look down the end of that first uh, column there, you'll talk, it talks about the two books of the Maccabees. And it says, all of which, all of the apocryphal books, uh, the church may read and take instruction from, so far as they agree with the canonical books. But they are far from having such power and efficacy that we may from their testimony confirm any point of faith or of the Christian religion. Much less may they be used to detract from the authority of the other, that is, the sacred books. Now, having said that, in uh, 2 Maccabees 2, verses 4 and following, it tells an account. <laughs> and, and and so you don't throw your psalters at me while I'm speaking. And the uh, the account says that when Jerusalem fell, 586 B.C., the northern kingdom of Israel fell, Jerusalem was conquered, the temple was destroyed, the book of Maccabees say that the prophet Jeremiah took that, that hidden jar of manna. He took it so that it wouldn't be destroyed and he hid it to be revealed only in the Messianic age. Interesting. And then we read here in John, in Revelation chapter 2, John says, the Lord Jesus says to John, to him who overcomes, to him who is faithful and conquers in the end, I will give some of the hidden manna. Jesus said, I as the bread of life will feed you, my people, for all eternity. I'll never go hungry again. I will also give him a white stone. Did you know that in John's day, in the jury system of Rome, they gave a white stone to the one who was acquitted, the one who was declared not guilty. If you got a black stone, you were in big trouble. If you got a white stone, it meant you were set free. What do we read in Romans 8, verse 1? There is therefore now no, what? Condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Think of it, no matter who we are, no matter what sin we have ever committed, through the shed blood of Christ, as it is applied to our account through faith in His name, by the grace of God, God says, not guilty. And go home. Friends, that's the glory of the gospel. That is the glory of the gospel. And Jesus said, I will also give him a white stone. Doesn't only mean acquittal, by the way. It was also your admission ticket into the public festivals. And so now we know we're not only set free, we're admitted to the marriage feast of the Lamb, which the book of Revelation speaks of later on. I will also give him a white stone with a new name written on it. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone. The new has come. And later on in Revelation 22, we read of God putting His name on our foreheads. And on and on it goes. That's a message for another time. I will also give Him a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to Him who receives it. Jesus said we will receive our reward. Praise God. Praise God. You know, friends, I can recall reading several years ago the supposedly true account of a railroad conductor, excuse me, switchman, railroad switchman, who was hauled into court for uh, failing to signal an oncoming train that there was danger on the track, and it resulted in a, in a tragic train wreck. And the switchman pleaded his case. And he said, Your Honor, I waved my red flag, the flag that I always wave when danger is approaching. I did it. I waved my red flag. 
But the conductor of the train took issue with that, and he said, no way, I saw him waving a flag, but he was waving a white flag. The flag which for years has always indicated that the tracks are clear. So the judge said, well, this issue can be resolved very easily. Will somebody please present me with the flag? They brought out the flag. And it was indeed a red flag. But you see, brothers and sisters, down through the years, the colors had so faded that especially from a distance, it appeared to be white. And the result of that lack of clarity in color was a tragic loss of life. Friends, you know, in a nutshell, that was the problem with the church at Pergamum so many years ago. That's the problem with many a congregation of Jesus Christ today. It's the problem with many a life today. Maybe some of the lives here this evening. We have fallen for Satan's lies. We have fallen for his seductions. We have heeded his call to compromise. And that lack of clarity in our colors. Especially when we think not only of ourselves, but of the next and of the next generation. Is, or very well could, result in an incredible loss of life. For time. For eternity. So dear friends, as you and I go forth from this place and we go out into a new week. Let us purpose in our hearts that we will not succumb and that this kind of sin will not be named among us. But rather individually and collectively, by the grace of God and through the power of the Holy Spirit, let us increasingly seek to remain firm in the faith, to repent of our sin. For Jesus said, then we will surely receive our reward. Reward that He has surely promised to give each and every one who resists and refuses to become engaged in the dangerous and deadly sin of dancing with the devil. Amen.